Greetings everyone. Welcome to the 224th session of the online Optum Learning Series OLS. And for today's session, we have with us Mr. Neil Latanik. Mr. Neil is an optometrist with experience of working within practice uh, as an educator as well as in professional services roles. He is the past president of the British Contact Lens Association and currently works as a head of professional development at Specsavers and is also an assessor and examiner for the College of Optometrists in the UK. Uh, previously, he is having a work experience in the contact lens industry, whereby in the UK he was at various different levels as one of the professional global levels as well. Uh, he is also a past chair of the British and Irish University and College Contact Lens Educators. And uh, he's been awarded with the fellowships from the prestigious organizations, the BCLA, as well as the IACL. Uh, so with that experience, uh, Neil is going to take us through how to maximize uh, contact lens practice and how to be successful with our patient with evidence base. So welcome, Neil, onto our platform. And let me just, uh, you know, leave the screen time to you, please. Thank you for that warm introduction and thank you everyone for joining us today. So we would like to keep it interactive as well. So if there's any questions that you would love to ask, please pop them in the chat and we can address those as well as we're going along or at the end. So we've got a really exciting session for you today about how can we maximise the best care for our contact lens patients. And what we'll do is we'll start off um, looking at what does the evidence suggest we do. So we'll look at some um, prestigious publications out there and what they suggest we do in practice. We'll apply that to four clinical cases to see how we can bring this to life within our own practices. And then we can self-reflect and conclude what might the learnings need to be for the future. So that's how simple we're going to try and make it. Let's see what, what happens. So I have got a quick question for you before we get going, and that's, Given we know there's so many amazing benefits of contact lenses, there are visual benefits, there are emotional benefits, there are practical benefits. So why, why is it that the contact lens penetration is so low? We know we've got millions of successful wearers, but it should be billions or trillions. So if we open a poll, why do you think more people are not wearing contact lenses? 67% of them think is because of the lack of uh, recommendation from the ECPs. And I think it's a very close fight between unsuitability and not interested. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, and do you know what? All the evidence out there agrees with you. Most people um, presume that they're not suitable because they've just not been mentioned to them during their eye exams or, or, or eye health checkups. Um, they they just make that presumption. Um, I've got some details later on exactly how many people are suitable for contact lenses, but I, I won't all that surprise and um, but most people if you ask them can you see benefits of contact lenses they do they see those practical ones and that we've talked about in visual what's really interesting is when you compare non-wearers and wearers in the research actually current contact lens wearers will say there's also a lot more emotional benefits and non-lens wearers don't always see those at first until they experience them for themselves um, so anyway, let's see how that shapes our discussion. So thank you for, for contributing there. As I promised, we're going to look at some of the key publications. Now, I'm sure you may be familiar with these already, but just as a reminder, there was a suite of publications in the Contact Lens and Eye journal, which really embedded what we consider the Bible of, of Contact Lens guidance, because over 200 experts and authors from around the world came together to form a series of 10 publications on various aspects of contact lenses and really form that consensus as to what we should be doing. There's also other special editions in those journals that have looked at, for example, speciality eye care and, and help us understand, you know, things that we should be doing there as well. And of course, there are publications in other journals as well. But at the time of them doing that clear reports, they actually reviewed over 19,000 publications on contact lenses. So you probably want to avoid reading 19,000 papers. There's probably over 20,000 papers now since, um, available. You could read these summaries, but there are still these reports over 300 pages. So if you want to really condense that down, you could look at this, 
which is the clinician's guide, which is just a five page overview of all those juicy nuggets that you can utilize in practice. And there is a link there on the BCLA site to that. And they've also been translated into several different languages. And James Wilson added up how much time it would take you to read all of those publications. And actually, it would take you over 17 weeks. So if you read the five page summary, you've automatically saved yourself 17 weeks worth of potential reading if you were to have the ambition of reading all those contact lens publications. So when we talk about an evidence based approach, what do we really mean? What we're really saying is, is we should review the literature and the research that's out there and there will be different levels to that research from high-end um, cocaine reviews which have you know really strong research credentials through to case scenarios now there will be occasions where people are not um, in line with average and therefore case scenarios and publications of those smaller natures are relevant still because not everyone is average what we need to also do is look at how we apply our own professional clinical judgment and that will be influenced by the patient's desire and needs as well and elements of their lifestyle and also involving them in decisions about their care. So really we should take whatever science and literature are out there, the decisions that we make as clinicians with our expertise and apply that to be individualised to the patient in our chair. So we'll look at how we might do that with the case scenarios later. But what's really interesting is some of our approaches are not necessarily always based on the strongest evidence. So if I just bring two things up, for example, a lot of us may talk about the 20-20-20 rule. For example, when you're on a computer, you may ask people every 20 minutes to look away for 20 seconds at 20 metres, just as an intervention to break up that screen time. But actually for a long time, there wasn't really any evidence to say that that actually worked or, or that it should be 20-20-20 and not different numbers. Again, until the BCLA Clear reports, we, with modern lenses, had no real evidence as to whether we needed to um, have a tailored approach or whether they could gradually or they need to gradually build up their wear time with soft lenses. Sorry, I'm just going to move you guys slightly out of the view there. So actually, if there's no evidence there, should we stop these? Well, actually, there is now evidence that you don't need to gradually build up wear time with modern soft lenses. So we can stop doing that if we wish. It might be still relevant for some patients though, and certainly other lens types, such as rigid lenses, um, as an example. And actually, the 2020 rule, I would argue we should do because one, research changes very quickly. And there is now evidence out there that this does work in reducing dry eye symptoms. And also, some sort of intervention is often useful, even if it's not the strongest supported in the literature. It may be that this rule changes with time, but it is very simple and effective. And there are other rules that we've been applying across, for example, in myopia that help us, you know, um, manage our patients. For example, you may have come across the 30-30 out rule and balanced vision, um, which basically means read things at least 30 centimetres away go outside for 30 minutes and ensure you get that balance between seeing distance things and near things when we're trying to win the war on myopia management. So if we go back to our tasks of contact lenses, if we want people to be successful with contact lenses, we need to ensure they have the right motivation. So we have to very carefully ask questions that identify their need. So one thing you may want to ask them is, is, are there any activities where they like to not wear their glasses for, or they would like freedom from their glasses? And understand, you know, what they're doing in their lifestyle, what they're doing in their day-to-day -day tasks for work, and also elements of their eye health. And then we can match all this to pick the most appropriate lens for them. And we can also identify any risk factors which might guide us to a certain lens type. For example, if we think there may be more at risk of non-compliance, we might decide that actually something that they replace more regular, like a daily disposable, is a better choice for them. So one of the things that we need to think about in terms of when we are maximising the success with contact lenses is what that contact lens may do when the lens is placed on the eye. Now, we know that there's a lot of literature out there showing that there are various changes in the way that 
uh, sorry, as to what happens when you put a contact lens on, it does disrupt the eye. But what's really interesting is, is, is that how that might impact contact lens performance is still fairly unknown. And actually, some of the things that you might think might lead to something not being as good at performance may not be the case. So if I take one example, there was some research out there that suggested that lenses that had a more of a knife edge, which actually induced more staining on the eye, actually those patients reported them to be more comfortable than lenses that induced less staining with a different set of characteristics. So again, does it everything always match up? Other areas, for example, redness. Redness of the eye can be a sign of distress, but it can also be not related to contact lenses at all as well. So we really need to work out whether something is contact lens related or not. Of course, an ill-fitting lens would be, and we want to look particularly at those limbal areas. We also want to look for signs of hypoxia too. But what the literature is telling us as well is that actually, even though a lot of the early focus was on the tear film, we do need to think about some of those other structures as well. We need to make sure that it works in harmony with the eyelid. And we also need to understand about what's happening and maybe any impact on blinking. We know that that does change. And of course, all of these things can trigger dryness and other symptoms that can impact performance. We also know that there are sub um, inflammatory responses occurring in contact lens wearers, although we don't quite know what that really means. So there'll be a lot more exciting stuff, I'm sure, coming out of the science, but it is important that we do look at the eye with a contact lens on to make sure it is compatible as possible. And what's also important to remember, and I took from the paper on this, was that actually the anatomy and optics, they do change throughout our life. So we will more than likely need to change the contact lens type and design throughout someone's lifestyle to best match their needs. Okay, so if we now look at thinking about what else do we need to do apart from check the eye before we fit a contact lens, well, we need to decide what measurements to take. And what was interesting in one of the papers was that actually one of the core measurements we do take, corneal topography, alone, um, that does not inform soft lens fitting very well. What we should be more interested in is the sagittal height of the cornea and lens. And, and just to help, what the sagittal height means basically is how much does that contact lens stand proud of the eye. And actually, we don't often get that information from manufacturers, although there are some conversion tables out there that exist should you want to know. And this can explain as well why you may get two lenses with the same base curve that actually perform very differently on eye. So we can't just go off that alone. Obviously, for other lens types, corneal topography is more important. And in fact, you probably want to go even beyond that cornea, especially for scleral lenses, because you need to understand that topography across the whole front surface. Again, there was very little evidence as to what might influence the diameter choices for soft lenses as well. So some of these measurements that we take, how useful are they in modern day contact lens fitting? And I promised that I'd share with you some details about suitability. Impressively, most eyes can actually be fitted with mass-produced soft contact lenses, nearly 90%. And for those that can't, we have those more tailor-made lenses out there that should be able to work. So really, when we come to contact lens suitability, the majority of people are suitable. Of course, caveats are if they've got certain diseases or active infections on the eye, you would not fit those during those periods. So if we now consider soft lens um, assessments and what we need to do, what's really lovely in the evidence-based practice paper is a suggestion as to how we could all uniformly assess that contact lens fit so that we can all interpret that record keeping easily. And they suggested that it, the ideal time to check a soft lens is around the 10 minute mark. Reflex tearing should have subsided. You should be able to gauge an idea of the comfort of that lens on application and an idea of the coverage. And the simple scale that they suggested using is a three point scale um, for assessing soft lens fit, which looks something like this. So we want to know what the centration is like. B stands for movement on blink. You'd expect modern soft lenses to move up to around half a mil. Some of the older designs can move a little bit more on post blink movement in up gaze. You want to look at the lag, so when people look to, um, away from the central position, how much really does that lens slip? And that's what the lag is referring to. 
So a 50 to 100% increase in the scleral overlap on those gaze positions. And of course, the last test we should do is push up because it's more invasive. And you want to make sure that that isn't sluggish and it has that smooth recovery. What was interesting was if you were to take any of these measurements in isolation, they're not very good at predicting how well a lens might be successful. If anything, push ups seem more relevant, but actually collectively, you know, they do form that interpretation for us. Um, obviously, a, an ill fitting lens won't be comfortable necessarily. So, what I'd love to do now is to take a case scenario and just get some thoughts as to what we might do with Kevin. So Kevin is a 51 year old. He wears very focal glasses most of the time at work. At home, he does a lot of close work, tends to take his glasses off for reading there because he's a myop, minus five, has a 150 yard on his last refraction, good visions. And he asks about contact lenses. And he suggested he might just start off with them for social use. So I'll go back to another poll, if that's okay with you guys. And I'll ask you, what would be your first fitting choice for Kevin? And I appreciate there might be more cons information you might use to make that decision. But are you more likely to go single vision contact lenses and then build him up? Would you go multifocal? Would you go for monovision? Or would you go for another um, lens such as orthokeratology? So almost 75% of them would uh, want to suggest multifocals. Uh, then you have about 15-17% monovision and a couple of them are also interested to suggest single vision contact lenses as well. Okay. Well, it's interesting to see there is a range of choices there. If we look at what came out of the studies, the evidence out there suggests that our first choice really should be a multifocal contact lenses because they generally perform well. They also, when you see four choice experiments where people have tried the different options, multifocals, monovision and single vision, maybe using glasses over the top for reading, they go for the multifocals because they perceive those extra benefits, those functional vision benefits, the contrast sensitivity, um, and the convenience as well. And in fact, the younger you get someone into multifocals in terms of a lower ad level versus a higher ad level, the easier that adaption um, seems to be. So really, our first choice where possible should be multifocal contact lenses. Of course, there will be aspects at all times where you may only be able to go, for example, for monovision or single vision, if they've got you know quite a high sale and they just don't come in the multifocal parameters. Um, but really, there are lots of multifocal options out there available to us and they all tend to be simultaneous image designs which means you're presenting the brain with two different images and it has to make sense of that by sieving out the noise so it does take the brain a, a little bit of time to get used to we call that neuroadaption but most people do do very well with them they broadly fall into two main buckets you've got bifocal ones and multifocal ones with the bifocal ones, there are some, for example, where you've got annual um, diffractive and decentered ones. Of course, if there's a um, segment on there, a decentered one, it's really important that they put it in the right eye. So a bit like very focal glasses to make sure that reading portion falls in the right place when they do read and it's not on the other side of their eye. And with the multifocal ones, of course, you get various different combinations. They're probably more of the lenses available we've socked out there. You've got aspheric and you may have center near. You may have center distance, so slightly different biases to where those vision aspects are. You've got multi-zone and you've got these extended depth of field ones that are designed to try and increase the depth of focus by giving a little bit more flexibility and give as it progresses from the center distance out towards the reading. So there's lots of choice out there. But what they all involve doing basically is looking at how you can play with higher order aberrations. And they will all induce them to different levels in different places. And that's why someone might prefer one design and someone else might prefer another design. So it's great that we've got lots of options out there, but it does mean that even if, if someone doesn't get on with one, it doesn't necessarily mean that they won't get on with a different design. And it's all about how much of the spherical aberration that they may be impacting and how that really um, goes in line with what is in that patient's eye in terms of their levels of um, spherical aberration as well. 
So in terms of the fitting selection with the multifocal lenses, best thing to do is get an up-to-date refraction. And with most of them, you want to push the plus. So the most distance plus you can give them and the least reading add. So there's less of a change potentially across that lens. You want to account for any BVD, certainly for higher prescriptions over a four. And you need to think about small cylinders. If the cylinder is significant, then obviously you may want us to consider fitting a multifocal toric lens or, or some of those other designs. Baseline measurements we've talked about already. Um, and also getting a feel for their dominant eye. Now, with multifocal contact lenses, the literature is actually suggesting that sensory dominance tests are preferred over motor dominance in terms of being linked to success. So that would be using a blur lens to work out the dominant eye rather than a pointing type method. And the most important tip we can give you is follow the manufacturer's fitting guidelines. Because, for example, with one lens, it might suggest maybe putting two lows in, and with another manufacturer's guide it might suggest a low in one eye a medium in the other and it might even in some ask you to tweak the distance power given slightly based on the findings so don't just make those presumptions that one means it'll be the same in another can we really predict the success of a multifocal contact lens and, and what does the literature tell us on this well unfortunately it suggests that actually our crystal ball is not that useful because if you take each of the variables in isolation, whether that's how well they can see, the ocular physiology, the pupil size, their lifestyle, in isolation, they're not actually great predictors of which multifocal a patient will prefer. So we need to take a combined approach. Equally, there's studies showing that initial lens fitting may not actually be a good predictor of long-term performance as well. And like I said, there is that neural adaption process. And that's why we usually say, take them away and give them a chance to experience the lenses and see what happens around two weeks later. So that neural adaption in some can take up to around 15 days for them to really, you know, um, use that lens to its best potential. And I always say, try it at home at first, you know, in a safe environment. Put this graph in, which I created for something else I was doing from some work that was done actually, you know, um, at Bradford University, which basically just shows how the pupil does change with age, but also in different levels of, of lighting conditions. And you can see, of course, we've got to make everything happen within the pupil refractive for it to be useful in a contact lens. But you can really see as you get older and as the lighting changes, you know, how that pupil size will change. So we've got a lot to achieve over a small area. But it does remind us as well that the lighting does have an important role in this as well. How else can we maximise, um, for example, visual performance? Well, with a multifocal lens, centration is key. And what's really interesting is when we often look at centration, we look at the centre of the eye, maybe the centre of the pupil as our guide. That's not actually the visual axis, is it? <laughs> we know the visual axis is slightly inferior and nasal as well. And we don't really have that marked on a lens to check whether that is in place. And what we do know is if you don't have a, a well-centered lens or, or good fit, then the vision will potentially be impacted. And again, that might explain why one lens may behave slightly different to another lens. And I thought this was really interesting. And this was in the optics um, BCLA clear paper. And what they showed here was if you just decentered the same multifocal lens by half a millimeter, you can see how much it degrades the vision. And there has been some work done where people have moved around where the near portion is um, in the varifocal just to see if that improves vision without any impact on the distance performance. So you can see how manufacturers are really trying to home the design of their lenses to make them as best as they possibly can be. Of course, there are other elements that come into play. So if we really want to maximise performance, if we see any pre-existing pathology, um, then we need to manage that. And it may mean, for example, if they've got dry eye, or blepharitis that we give them a slightly different plan when they're wearing their lenses um, to when they're not wearing their contact lenses. Medications. There's a lot of people on medications nowadays for a whole range of conditions and a lot of those powerful drugs can actually have an impact on the ocular surface um, and can dry out that tear films and things even for mental health, a lot of those antidepressants 
um, can can lead to dry eye as well as some of the ones that impact hormones. And Demodex has actually been linked to, to drop out as well. So these are all things that we can look out for. Of course, if we're not getting a good wetting surface and dryness occurs, that can impact visual quality as well. Because we know the tear film is that final um, small, maybe around 10% of, of our visual system. So again, it's really important that we check that surface too. And maybe there are, are, are red flags and things that we can look for along the way. So for example, um, I remember Linda and Joe mentioning that if you're comfortable wearing time has a difference of greater than two of what they you know, desire to wear them for, then they're at risk of following that pathway towards dropout because the lenses are not performing as they should be. Again, have they adapted their wearing times in any way? If it's reduced slightly, is that a red flag to say that actually that's because there is an underlying issue there? Okay, so what we do know, obviously, to with multifocal lenses, communication is key to success. So we need to relate things to real world vision rather than just what they can see on our testing charts. And that might be asking them about how their vision is during certain tasks, for example, driving, when they're using their laptop, their smart devices, um, and understand. Try and set realistic expectations. So, you know, if they say I can't read as well as I can do, where do you need to hold it to read? And if that's slightly longer away, you might relate that to their motivation and say, well, if you do hold it that little bit further away, you still get to wear your contact lenses to do that. Um, so there are, you know, reminders of, of why they enjoy wearing contact lenses that might be useful. Or you could explain if you, you know, increase the power that that might help. But actually, it may make some changes to their distance. So where is the right compromise for them to get the best functionality? And of course, lighting is their friend. So using good lighting will always make a difference as well, especially if it's positioned in the right place. And I've said this a couple of times, think about as well, make sure that they have had that time to get used to the lens. Don't jump in too soon and try and make changes on initial fit, because that might not be the case as to what's needed when they've had chance to experience that lens in their own environment. And the other great thing about us being able to do video consultations and, and we can understand what's happening in their home environment. And quite often their lighting is rubbish. So we've talked quite a bit about soft multifocal options here. Are there any other options that we need to know about and we can mention in passing? Well, actually, there are some great rigid and even scleral options as well. And a good thing about a scleral lens is, is there is a potential for them to, you know, decenter that ad exactly wherever they want it to be, because we know those lenses don't tend to move as much on eye. And this is a case where someone hasn't necessarily got the best vision, you know, 6, 9 and M5, but is really successful with contact lenses and happy with what they're achieving. So don't think it's only for those, you know, with perfect vision. This person, you know, enjoys having an upswept bifocal lens and only actually has one good functioning eye and it's working for them. So again, it's all about that expectation setting as well. Just to conclude off with the fitting aspects, the education is really important and for us to think through what we're doing. Um, so we need to think about when we might recall the patients and how we might interact with them in the period outside the practice. So do you issue leaflets, digital resources, and how do you embed those best practice behaviours and compliance from the start with the regimes that you want to set? We need to re reiterate several times to land messages as well. So do your whole team throughout the contact lens journey say the same messages and train people in the same way? And it might be worth spending some time with the rest of your team so that you have that consistent approach. It was always really useful with a new wearer to do a courtesy follow up call within the first week of lens wear. And you can even, if they are, for example, struggling handling, see what's happening in their own environment. Check if they're washing their hands, see how they're positioning themselves in front of a mirror, for example, and give them that extra coaching they need. Or you might be able to then recommend bringing them back in for additional training if that is needed. So just as a reminder, actually, why might someone not get on with contact lens initially if they're a new wearer? Well, the top three reasons tend to be handling related, which is something we should be able to do something around about with the right education. It could be visual related, especially if it's toric and presbyopia. So again, that might be around setting expectations and um, maybe that tweaks are needed. And of course, comfort as well. 
So we'll talk about how we might address that, you know, with the later cases. It's also worth noting that some people can have handling issues even if they're an inexperienced wearer. So even experienced daily disposable wearers, around two thirds of them, said that they do have some frustrations with handling. So I would suggest you revisit that aspect of every aftercare to find out how they are getting on with their lenses. I know they're falling into bad habits with their routines as well, that you can then coach them back on best practice. So just to change gear a little bit. So if we look at Claire, Claire's a 22 year old, she's coming for a routine aftercare. She's a toric monthly wearer and she has no symptoms. <laughs> What's really lovely in the evidence-based practice paper is it gives a really comprehensive routine for you to follow in your aftercares. And it's kind of split into three main areas, updating information, current aspects, what's happening now, and what do you need to reiterate and potentially manage in that patient. So again, if you took that example of, of someone with their um, cleaning habits, you could ask them what solutions they buy, you know, do they always buy the one that you recommend? And Current aspects, you could ask them to demonstrate how they clean the lenses and, and check all those aspects and observe them while they're in the aftercare. And it may be that that identifies something that you need to reiterate in the management. And it might be that you then arrange for a reteach or, or something just to embed the right behaviours. So again, I'm not going to read through all these lists because it's pretty comprehensive, but um, it's there for you should you want to dive into that paper. So in terms of toric lenses, there is a little bit extra for us to do in, on the checking aspect, and that is involved in looking at a marker on the lens and also some additional history questions. So what do we know about most um, designs? If anything, they had a tendency to rotate nasally. So it's something that we might want to take into consideration if someone's halfway between an axis, say they come in 10 degree steps and they're 175, do you go 180 or 170? You could think if anything, it's possibly going to rotate nasally, so therefore you would round accordingly in the right and left eye using cars or las. We know that modern lens designs perform really well. You know, they stabilise well, certainly in the primary position. And what we also know is that the different designs have slightly different makeups and different amounts of potentially prism to achieve that toric effect. And actually some can have up to around just over one diopter. And it might be useful when you're picking a design to think about other aspects such as um, tightness of lids, but also um, BV aspects if someone's maybe at risk of BV issues, especially if they only need a toric in one lens, what might put in a bit more prism due to their binocular status. <laughs> of course, when we're looking at the marker, and this um, video is courtesy of Kia, you need to understand what markers that for the lenses that you're fitting may have. So we'll all, all have slightly different ones. And we need to think about a few aspects here. So in terms of um, what do we want to assess, we want to assess where the marker is orientated and also how stable is it on blink? How much is it rotating? And the tolerance level of a patient might actually be different, potentially depending on their refraction, you know, what they tend to be using there for and the cell. And there was a paper that found actually that some people with a small cell, you know, the 075, might actually tolerate things being off axis up to 30 degrees before it seems to have a, an impact on their vision. Whereas obviously a larger cell, that might be much less. But really, you want it stable. And um, the research says it's within about six degrees. And rotational stability, if that lens is moving too much, you probably need to look at a different design because it's not a case then of just adapting the axes accordingly. What's often sometimes done in the research as well is, is how much does that lens take to recover if you manipulate and misalign it? So maybe with a cotton wool, but if you move it 45 degrees, how long does it take before it returns to the primary position where it should be? And if that's very sluggish, that might have an impact when people are potentially moving their eyes around or if something you know, dislodged their lens. What's also really important is to think about what happens in different gaze positions as well. And this is um, a chart that is quite often used in research where they, they plot really what happens when you look in different positions. And that could be useful when you're talking to patients about what's happening with their vision. Because if you think about when you're driving, you're quite often flicking up your eyes, depending on whether you're driving a left or a right handed car, to look in the mirror to reverse. You're also looking down towards that gear stick and to the side. So actually, if the lens is, sorry, is moving off axes quite a bit 
in those peripheral gaze positions. That could be impacting the performance during those tasks. And we also know that actually, if you've got suboptimal vision, that can impact comfort as well in, in toric wearers. So we really want to maximise that visual potential. What happens if they've got low astigmatism? Well, actually, um, should we go for a spherical or a spheric design? The research is a bit mixed here to say that people don't necessarily um, appreciate spheric more than aspheric, some prefer one, some prefer the others. And I guess that depends on what their natural level of spheric collaboration is. I mean, aspherics are designed to take that average level of spheric collaboration, 0.18, and, and start off with trying to deal with that. But what is clear in the research now is, is that actually trying to mask with a soft lens a small amount of astigmatism doesn't really work. So, for example, that's when you're doing means very clear, maybe um, to account for, for astigmatism. What you're best really doing is putting in a toric lens. So for a soft lens, start with torics or 75 and above. And for a rigid lens, you will get that tear film correcting some of that underneath the lens anyway. And that tends to stop, you know, when you get to around two doctors, when really because of shape factors, you need to go for a, a toric lens. And obviously back surface toric, and if there was any residual astigmatism, that would be added to the front surface there as well. And actually, if you look at people who are around 475 or 1 diopter of sill, the difference between them wearing a spherical lens versus a toric lens helps them achieve around about a line difference in visual acuity on their chart. And again, there is that perceived visual benefit as well. So the tip here is, is think about what they're doing in their everyday life and ask about the visual stability during those. So does your vision fluctuate when you are driving? How is it when you're on the computer? Those kind of things that will tease out for you, you know, whether that astigmatism lens is working as it should be. So we'll move on to Laurie now, if that's okay. So we're now looking at a rigid corneal lens wearer. So she previously wore contact lenses um, and basically you decide to fit her today with a rigid lens. This is the appearance of the fluorescein. So I was going to bring you back in if that's okay. And just ask you based on that lens picture, what do you think of that lens? So I'm aware that sometimes when the polls come up, you may not be able to see the image as well, but would you say that that pattern looks aligned, steep or fit? Well, there we go. Almost 54% of them uh, think is uh, steep. 30% uh, say it's a line and about 14% of them say it's flat. So it's kind of mixed results here as well. Yeah. So I'd probably agree with the half of you that said it was steep. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. yeah. So the reason I'd go for this is, is when I look at a rigid lens, I always look at it in three areas. So if you start off in the middle, um, can you see fluorescein? If you can, then you know, um, and how far does that fluorescein go out? And also how bright is that fluorescein? In this case, that fluorescein is going out all the way to the mid periphery and, and a bit further. So that would suggest if anything, it's more on the steep side. You, like I said, the mid periphery has got, you know, staining there as well. And if you look at the edge, the nice thing is, is it has got an even edge clearance all the way around. Um, normally that's about 0.5 to 1 mil, so it might be slightly less than is ideal, um, but because of that overall pattern, it is on the steeper side than the aligned side. But actually, looking at the overall size as well, it's pretty good size overall. The other aspect you want to look at with the fluorescein is, is, is whether there's any sharp changes that could suggest that there's some roughness underneath of one of the surfaces that is digging in as well. We're looking at the tradition, transition between the fluorescein patterns as well. But like I said, look at the three areas, the middle, um, sorry, yeah, the middle, the mid periphery and the edge. Okay, and if you want to um, apply the same fitting principles that are in the BCLA Clear report, I won't read all of these out, but I think you'll get a sense for a uniformed approach. Comfort rating could be on zero to 10. Coverage, you're looking at this in terms of how it relates to the limbus and the HVID with a plus two to minus two scale. Centration, you could just use the letters within the limbus, crosses the limbus or, or the pupil. And then the amount of movement. We know the movement will be more of a soft lens. Of course, we can't check that in this position because we've not got a dynamic video of it. It was just a flat image. Um, but again, you know, from a two millimeter scale downwards. And then you've got your 
um, fluorescein pattern. So we look at that fit co conformity overall. We could use a plus two steep to a minus two flat and also that edge width that we talked about earlier as well. Zero being the optimum level of around a millimetre. Okay. <laughs> so this is how the record keeping um, could be uh, of the lens that's shown on, on screen now, just to give you some ideas there. But it's something that you might want to just spend a bit of time looking at in more detail afterwards. The other thing that's really important to assess is the lens ocular surface. One, if the lens is, is, is chipped or broken in any way, then that will impact the performance and, of course, the fitting. But also you want to look at the wettability and any deposits and those areas there. And I do think that that's quite an underestimated area that people often um, leave out. In terms of when's the optimal time to check for corneal staining, the suggestion is one to three minutes after fluorescein installation. And if we're looking for conjunctival damage and we're using, for example, um, lysamine green and we're looking for lid wiper epithelopathy, you probably need it a little bit longer. So one to five minutes. You can combine them, but you quite often need quite a bit more lysamine green than you do fluorescein, just of the way that it comes out. But of course, they should be the last test to be done because they are the most invasive there as well so in our clinical decision making what could we do if we've got a steep fitting lens or we can either increase the back optic zone radius or decrease the total diameter in this case i'd probably play with the back optic zone radius because size wise you know it seems quite okay and a larger lens actually is more likely to be more stable and um, what we do know is, is that a steeper lens does give a positive effect of the tear film. So we're likely to get some over refraction there that we need to consider. And the general rule I apply is, is if you're going flatter, you add plus, steeper, you would need to add more minus to if you want the same equivalent overall. Um, so again, a little bit of RGP basic lens um, stuff there. So again, if you are looking at the fluorescein pattern in particular, you probably the optimum viewing time is 30 seconds to um, three minutes post installation. And these just show you how um, technology can help us. So these are some of the um, manufacturers um, apps and software that they've got available that can help you predict fluorescein patterns. And this is really showing actually if you've got you know, quite a toric cone and you put a spherical lens on it, versus a toric lens, how that pattern would appear and how you get that, you know, more aligned fit when you've corrected each meridian individually. Of course, if you've got a small bit of um, astigmatism, then the tear film under the lens of butt eye effect might actually be helping visual um, performance, so not be an issue. Okay, so we'll move on to um, case number three, just to keep going. So. Again, Matthew, he attends for a routine aftercare. He doesn't report any symptoms. He's got a slightly sore eye. And he sometimes admits to sleeping in his hydrogel lenses. And you see this on the eye here. So I'll open the poll up just to get your thoughts on, you know, what it might be. Appreciate there is much more you may ask clinically. Um, and sorry, do clinically and asking your history to really, you know, come up with a cause. So almost 40% of them... Uh think that it is contact lens peripheral ulcer, then it's hypoxia related, then you have microbial keratitis neck to neck, and a couple of them probably think it could be a foreign body as well. Okay, so let, let's try and see if we can work out um, what we think it is together. So let me go back. And one thing that isn't clear in the early days is, is it could be a few different things because of the way how things um, can present when they are early on. In this case, the most likely cause is, is that it's a contact lens peripheral ulcer. And one thing that you can use to help with that, I always used to teach and um, my students to think of pedal. So um, is there any pain? Um, is there epithelial involvement? Um, has it gone further than just the epithelium? Is there any discharge? Is it watery or, or not? Has the anterior chamber become infected? Um, is the cells there? And where's its location? So peripherals will tend to be more, um, will not tend to be centrally, but more out in the peripheral. Um, with microbial keratitis, they do tend to be central, but they could happen anywhere really. And in the periphery, but with that, you tend to get a lot more symptoms, a more aggressive red eye, and it tends to spread more. Whereas if you look 
at the image, you can see it is more discreet and, and a focal spot. And the clue probably is, is that it's only slightly sore, whereas MK, of course, you know, you've got a gammy red, more painful eye. But I do appreciate, you know, on day one, um, that's why it's really important if you are looking at these that you can fully differentiate between the two. And if there is any doubt, you may still consider getting a specialist to look at or bringing them back the next day to ensure. What you'd find with a peripheral ulcer is, is that if you take the lens out, it should start to um, resolve and shouldn't necessarily progress. So if it's progressive, then it is likely to be an infectious nature. And of course, what's the most common cause of a peripheral ulcer? Well, it's usually non-compliance. Something's got on the lens that the um, body, if you like, is reacted to. So it's an inflammatory response. It's not necessarily active infection with bacteria. And this could be something maybe got under the lens, it's slept in it, and therefore it's irritated the eye in that way. So if we look at how we can minimise risk of infection overall, Five tips that have been given is, well, avoiding overnight wear because we know the risk of complications and infection increases by around 20 times with overnight wear. Um, avoid water exposure, and that's really to help prevent potentially acanthamoeba keratitis and some of those microbial keratitises. Consider how they um, you know, wash their hands, how they look after the lens in case we know compliance with cases is, is probably the poorest area. So you might consider daily disposables where possible has around half the number of compliance steps so automatically you know improves um in that regard and have a proactive approach if there's any change to the eyes ensure they come to see us early so i often say do your eyes feel good you know from a comfort point of view do you see well and do they look good i hear they're not getting red obviously in the image there you can see this is much more aggressive you know much raised so much more likely to be a microbial keratitis there you know a very red angry eye and if you did want to look at the differences, there is a, class, a new classification of contact lens complications, which was in the paper by Fiona Stapleton. And really what she's done here to make it more useful for us in practice is she's put the complications um, under um, these different buckets. So that's looking at it more from how they impact the eye rather than um, their, their actual etiology there. So what do they define as a contact lens complication? Well, it's an event that's caused by the contact lens. So in theory, taking it out should help resolve it. They are often symptomatic and do require some sort of intervention. That might be changing the lens design, um, or it may be, you know, um, in not very many cases, but ceasing lens wear for a temporary period. What's important is to address any modifiable risk factors and behaviours that might increase the risk along the way. And one thing that I found interesting was, even though contact lenses have been available for, what, nearly 140 years now, compliance levels is pretty much the same. We know people are rubbish at cleaning the lenses and at storing them and at washing their hands. And despite all of our awareness of this and different education approaches, habits haven't really changed. So it's how do we... What did change was, of course, hand washing with COVID, where all of a sudden we got much better at washing our hands because of those, you know, global campaigns on those aspects of the importance of hygiene. So, again, those papers go into more detail on those different complications. Um, and this was a nice table um, that, that I think you may benefit from, which compares some of those different complications, you know, side by side and the likely signs and symptoms of each. But if in doubt, if you think it's contact lens related, take it out and that should change. Like I said, active infection or non-contact lens related causes potentially will continue to get worse even when the lens is out. So have contact lenses changed with time? Well, slightly, but we still see them. But what there has been is a lot of the hypoxia related issues have largely been resolved. You only tend to see those now in an unhappy eye or compromised eye. Maybe if someone's had surgery, or they've got other pathology, or you do get some who are um, risk of hypoxia um, other than that. But generally, we don't see this in everyday practice anymore. What you're more likely to see is um, limbal redness. But there are other complications and, and others, and, and with the modern designs, you know, how is that surface interacting with the eye? What's going on under the eyelid as well? So we need to think about our education and intervention tactics, and also what will future advancements bring? So the fact that we're going to have drug delivery contact lenses might help with treatments, but also may help um, 
you know, for example, in other areas by having antimicrobial lenses um, so that they are, give that protective function. And also cases, they've looked at designs of those. Should they remind you when to replace them? Should they change colour? You know, how does it work if biofilms are building up? Is there any ways that we can let people know? So there is work done on how we can help in, in various different ways from the manufacturers at the minute. So just to finish on this aspect, if we want to maximise comfort as well, one of the things that we could do is look to the TFOS um, contact lens discomfort report. We kind of said there's some contact lens aspects that we could look at, and there are also the environmental aspects. But actually, one thing to bear in mind is, is, is with discomfort, there might not actually be any clinical signs. Um, and sometimes there may be reduced um, or changes clinically, but it might be only evident on certain tests and different in different individuals. Because we do need to be really observant of our patients. In terms of environmental factors, and there are some things that we can't do about. We can't necessarily change, you know, whether they're male or female. We may not be able to influence what medications they're on, but there is certainly advice we can give them alongside, you know, when they're in their environment, link habits, you know, what to do when they're outside um, and it's windy and, and those kind of things as well to maximise success. Although we know contact lens discomfort is, you know, around 50% of contact lens wearers, they experience it at times, we don't really understand the origin fully, and it is most likely to be multifactorial and a couple of things combined, but it can be related to mechanical issues, toxin exposure, infections, inflammation, and dry eye and microbial gland dysfunction as some examples. One of the other things that I wanted to highlight is we do need to keep pace with the evolving needs of our patients. And the um, TFOS have just released a new suite of lifestyle reports, actually, one of them being contact lenses, which really show, I mean, our modern way of living isn't necessarily the most healthiest, is it? We don't always exercise as much as we should. We don't often necessarily always eat the right food, a lot of fat, fast food, the environments we're working in, even with hybrid working, a lot of screen time at home. People are having more elective surgery and um, people are on different medications. And actually all these things can impact the ocular surface and potentially therefore have a link to contact lens success. Even cosmetic eye products, you know, have been, been linked to certain conditions. So <laughs> it might be worth finding out a bit more about our patients. And we can't presume what was the case two years ago hasn't changed if we see them, you know, next time round. So we should always ask about those lifestyle type questions as well and smoking, etc. And just to complete the circle, really, when we look at what might also influence the chance of them having um, an adverse ocular response and, and performance, this paper actually looked at all the different variables that might impact um, contact lens is if you were to substitute each of these. And they find out of 16 variables, 15 of them you know, could impact performance. And you can see them on screen there, all the way from edge profile, rounds of thickness, surface treatments, modulus. It all makes sense, doesn't it? Sort of differences. The only one that they couldn't find evidence of changing, making a, a true difference, was back surface design. And maybe that there's just not enough out there to make that conclusion. But it does show if you go from one contact lens to another, they're not necessarily always going to perform the same. So we've got to think very carefully when we are substituting lenses and um, that we make sure that the clinician is involved in making that decision for them. And then they're not just ordering whatever they wish online, potentially, or from other sources without, you know, gaining some professional advice where possible. And actually, we know that if someone hasn't been successful with a lens, there are other great options that are increasing in popularity. So although we've seen a bit of a drop in rigid lens, or I guess it's fairly consistent around the 9% of fitting new fit mark, or for keratology and scleral lenses are rapidly increasing. <laughs> and of course, sclerals are really great, you know, if people have dry eye or haven't had success with other lenses by, you know, bridging over that cornea and, and leaving that tail lens underneath, it is causing uh, sorry it is giving people huge advantages so you know you do need to think carefully about what other designs are available we also know optology is good because people can wear those in their own environment at night and then be free of lenses when they are in maybe some of those environments that are not as contact lens you know compatible during the day and also just the nice thing is, is our future isn't just using contact lenses to correct refractive error 
what we are seeing is it's been used much more in medical contact lens use as bandage lenses and as part of that feel healing. And of course, um, you know, with scleros, they could have batteries embedded in them so that they can also, you know, add value beyond refractive correction alone. And I'm sure the future is very bright and successful and there'll be much more coming along the way that we haven't even thought about. We know Google currently working on, you know, lenses where you blink and it changes your TV channel. And of course, there are implications, you know, where they could be useful for low vision as well. So there are various definitions of successful contact lenses, which is the theme of today. And really, um, this is one definition where successful contact lenses have been defined as comfortable contact lenses for at least 12 hours per day, at least six days a week, whilst being able to see it at least as well or better as, as their spectacles. And I think in conclusions today, um, we are going to see, you know, more drug delivery contact lenses coming out to help with dry eye and various other therapeutics, you know, potentially glaucoma, monitoring and treatment. Lenses are getting better at having wetting abilities, whether that's the material, whether that's the surface. And we, you know, we really need to be taking a proactive approach than a reactive to make sure people don't go on their path to drop out. And importantly, in summary, we do need to keep our consultants where it's happy and healthy. Therefore, we do need regular contact with them to understand any um, red flag signs. We need to take a evidence-based approach. We need to match everything to the individual's needs, which will change with time. And if we take a clear way to maximise success using the BCLA clear reports, we're um, well on the way to maximising patient care. As a reminder, there are also those summary sheets there that you could download and, and you know, dive into more detail when you get a chance. So I'd like to say, first of all, thank you for listening and happy to take any questions should anyone want to ask anything. Wonderful. Thank you, Neil, so much for that uh, comprehensive uh, presentation and taking us through the evidence of, uh, you know, what can lead us to a evidence-based successful contact lens practice. I think that that's the correct uh, way to put it forward. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. Okay. Uh, I think there was a couple of questions where people wanted to know what is the best type of lens uh in terms of uh, dry eyes and also what is the best type of multifocal lens what do you think uh, is there something in the evidence which clarifies a best lens yeah I, I think one of the good things about life is everyone is different and it's hard to have one general rule for all I mean, certainly when you're looking at dryness, um, if you were to take certain characteristics such as um, water content, higher water content in someone with dry is likely to dry out more because it loses more of that. So a lower water content lens may be better. And those tend to be some of those materials more like the silicon hydrogels. But also you need to look at the interrelationship with the lid as well, because if you've got, say, a lens that has a slightly higher modulus or, or characteristics, maybe a different lens design in a dry eye wearer, they may become more aware of it because there isn't as much smooth interaction between the lid and the tear film. The other thing to look at in dry eye wearers is, is, especially if you've got someone more prone to, say, lipid deposits as well, is what's happening on the front surface of that, that lens. Because if it's attracting more of the tear film and that's retaining on, that could potentially impact comfort as well. So, again, I, I think you can't really generalise as easily, but what you do want to do is, is just to look at that individual eye um, as it as a whole. Would you add anything else to that? or? Yeah, I think, I think that's uh, very well said. I think there's nothing like a best lens which you can say fit this lens and your patient will be happy. You need to take a holistic approach and look at other things as well uh, in terms of deciding the lens for your patients. Yeah. Yeah. And there is some misconceptions out there. It's seen like there's not much evidence between oxygen performance and dry eye, for example. So some people say, oh, I need a silicon eye gel because it lets me more oxygen. That's helping, you know, with the oxygen side, but that's not necessarily helping with potentially dryness what it's more likely is, is that it's got a lower water content or it's got a different mix of the front surface the other thing that is worth looking at though is with some of the 
where you might have version one of a console lens and, and later editions, what they tend to have in them is more wetting agents. And, and they're probably better, for example, than those same materials without those wetting agents in, because they t- have found a way of trying to lock that in and release them. And some will do that through the surface and, it, and it's not throughout the lens and some will embed it into the lens. So, you know, there are various different approaches manufacturers have taken. In terms of multifocal, um, the reason there's so many different multifocal designs and I used to work for a couple of suppliers and I said, well, why don't you all make sense in error? Why don't you all make sense of distance? And what they do is, is they look at the properties of their lenses and the optics and, and how much, for example, like I said, the operations are induced and they work out what are the best, if you like, profiles to suit that. And that's why they're all subtly different. And it would probably blow our minds to try and understand all that optics. Um, but what I would say is, is find out what your patient predominantly does so if they're living in the majority of their world is distance and they're for example doing a lot of driving and stuff you're going to want to do something where the bias is on that if maybe they're um, spending most time in their home they don't drive you know they're they're cooking they're cleaning a lot of their world is near to intermediate you might choose a design that's biased t- towards that um in, in in that regard um but they are all, all, all slightly different. And, and that's one of the things that the research said is, is it's hard to predict which one might work better than another with, without putting them on the eye. The extended depth of focus obviously do give that um, benefit um, in the way that they're promoted in terms of they're trying to give that bit more flexibility between them. Um, but I think you've just got to try them. But what I would say is, is try multifocal before a monovision option and, and just make sure their expectations are, are set correctly. Right. Yeah. Knowing, uh, and I think you did bring up uh, that point as well, knowing uh, what the patient really wants to wear their lenses for, understanding their lifestyle and all that would help you to choose an appropriate lens for them as well. Yeah, and that might mean you go for a sense of distance or a sense of near or whether maybe that choice or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But I think what we all know, even from my opening stuff, just trying to undercret people and compromise in, in those regards, it just doesn't work with modern you know um demands yeah and i think since we are on the topic of uh, multifocals <laughs> somebody would like to know if you could throw light on uh, the edof lenses uh, how do they really work uh, is there something which you would like to share about the edof lenses yeah so i mean with those and of course there's been talk about how useful they may be in my management as well what they're really trying to do is um you know have the, the distance in the center and you know they're working on the principle of, of stretching that focal point um across the retina and and what they're trying to do is, is create an area which um the image is good enough so that you're getting a bit more of a balance so whereas with other designs you've got a set power here and a set power somewhere else on the lens so that if you look in that position you're getting matchable vision what this is trying to do is, is almost give a bit more of a balance as a blend across um which the brain again interprets but the whole hope here is, is that you've got more more depth uh, as well right yeah so so that's how these lenses are created to increase the near range variability if, if i can put it that way to help to see at at the reading area yeah and i think one one really interesting thing is we do understand that contact lenses help uh, in certain cases to improve vision as well so we we might have a patient whose vision improves a couple of lines when they are wearing contact lenses versus while they are on spectacles is there anything which you would like to throw light on why does that happen or is that something to do with the optics? Is it something to do with uh, the refractive status of the eye or something like that? Sorry, I just missed that one. I think my signal paused a second. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just summarize in terms of uh, you know vision advantage with contact lenses. We do understand that wearing contact lenses also enhance vision for certain patients especially probably when it comes to higher refractive errors. Uh, do you think that what could be the cause of uh, that? Is there anything in the literature which suggests that? Yeah, well, optically, I mean, you are getting rid of some of that vertex distance. So you, you're losing, you know, certainly for a myop, you're changing the way that that image is perceived, you know, in the brain. So obviously there are huge advantages there of increasing field of view and depth of focus. You've also, you know, 
with spectacles often you know they get scratches on you know weather conditions wise you're not always seeing an if they move slightly, they're not always looking for the optical centres. So certainly, like you said, for those higher prescriptions as well um, in that regard. And I think people just like the freedom, you know, not having the glasses on and there's some psychological elements of that. But yeah, when you compare, you know, the, there has been studies and they compare. But what? I, sorry, let me say that another way. When you actually ask people, do they prefer glasses, contact lenses or, or not wearing anything? What they tend to say is, is, is that, well, they obviously need their visual correction, but actually contact lens whereas um, see the benefits of having both their glasses and their contact lenses because they know there are times where there might be tasks where they want to just put on their glasses. They know that they understand that they need to put those on at times. So actually, I think it's not just trying to promote contact lenses or glasses, but it's the benefits of having both. And then each day they can make that decision as to what they want to do that best suits them. So I'll be working at home some days and I'll just pop my glasses on first thing because it just seems easier. Other times I'll put my contact lenses in and, and it will vary. So I think we've got to be careful almost trying to promote one over the other. Um, rather than a uh, you know giving people the benefit of all options that's right yeah uh of course in terms of business aspect i mean that that was my last question uh, neil and you kind of covered that uh, little bit there when you talked about having glasses and contact lenses uh, a refractive error requiring patient or customer would need both uh, spectacles and contact lenses to complement their vision at times so it's not that a contact lens wearer may not need glasses or spectacle wearer may not need contact lenses. They both complement for different lifestyle what the patient wants to perform. So when it comes to business aspect, would you like to throw a little bit light on this when it comes to business on contact lenses? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the first point there is, is, I mean, our job is to offer the patients as much choice as we can, give them recommendations and to enhance their care and quality of life and vision. And actually, um, people appreciate it. So when you look at the data and people are contact lenses on spectacles, um, they're usually more loyal to the practice, partly because maybe you've seen them more often, but you've built up that more of a rapport. So if you've got their loyalty and they stay with you for years, that's guaranteeing business in, in that regard as well. Also, a contact lens wearer is more likely to spend more overall, you know, if you think about their glasses and contact lenses put together, but also to buy supplementary things. So, for example, a, a lot of them will say, well, actually, I, I would like a designer pair of sunglasses for where I'm wearing my contact lenses over the top uh, and some of those additional things as well. Um, and more likely to potentially have some of the additional services that you might offer you know, when they come to their eye health, especially if, if they are subsidised. What tends to help as well um, is if you get people onto, say, those direct debit type systems where they're maybe paying you a bit of money regularly and then, you know, they get, you know, the services provided for that. Yeah, great. Yeah. So I, I think with that, uh, we have taken uh, most of the questions which uh, came up on the chat. Thank you so much, uh, Neil, for sharing that with us. Sure. And uh, mm -hmm spending your uh, Sunday afternoon with us uh, today. Oh, well, thank you for inviting me and I hope everyone has a lovely day and um, hopefully I'll get to see you soon somewhere at a conference. Definitely, or yes. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, we do have session planned over the next couple of weekends and until then, take care, be safe and uh, hope to see you during the next session. Take care and bye-bye. See you later. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>